Thank you for joining us today and congratulations for taking an hour to pay attention to your own self-care. Um, it's a difficult thing to set a time aside for ourselves, so uh, you're already halfway there. Thanks for joining us. First, I am Carrie Michaels. I'm an extension educator at the University of Minnesota. I work in our Center for Family Development and with our Children, Youth, and Family Consortium. I am a public health educator and my area of focus is in mental health and well-being. Uh, this is a critical area of work given the past year of this pandemic experience. And so I work to create and deliver educational programs that help people and families and communities reach their optimal mental health. So that's a little bit about me, Chelsea. Thanks, Carrie. Hello, everyone. My name is Chelsea Williams. I use she, her pronouns. I also work with Carrie in the Center of Family Development, and I focus most of my work in health and nutrition, really right now um, supporting our SNAP-Ed Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program education in our ability to incorporate mental flourishing, mental well-being, community, um, or cultural healing into nutrition education, which has been a wonderful joy and I work across the state, but coming from you to you um, from South Minneapolis. All right. Um, this is a little bit about our agenda today. This will be an activity oriented webinar. We'll be asking you to privately record some responses to some of the content that we present today. We hope this will be a first step for you toward knowing what works for you and committing to moving in that direction. Uh, first, we come to you today from the University of Minnesota, which is a land grant institution. So I want to acknowledge that in 1862, 52 land grant institutions uh, were established on nearly 11 million acres of land that were forcibly taken from indigenous nations. The University of Minnesota resides on Dakota lands. So we work within a system that came at a large human and environmental cost. So part of the work that we do in promoting mental health relates to the global and historical experiences of trauma that many people have experienced. And to make this next hour as useful to you as possible, we will ask you to be a little active as we move through this content. Uh, if you could, please take out a sheet of paper and something to write with. And we will ask you from time to time to write some things down as they apply to you to help you gain a clearer understanding of your own mental well being and as a reminder for self care. This is for your use only. We will ask people to share at the end if they're comfortable about what they've learned so that others might learn from you. So, our first activity is to begin by writing down that barrier that you identify to taking care of your own mental health or more than one barrier. What prevents you from doing the things that help you? Um, maintain your own health and well-being. And as you're doing that, I will share you mine. So I'm going to, throughout this presentation, share you my notes. Um, my barrier is decreased motivation. That has progressed throughout this year with increased isolation and uncertainty. Um, and it's due to the limited routine that many of us are in and a lack of engaging uh, energizing activities in my life and too little sleep. So that's one of my main barriers. So if you could also um, write down your reasons for being here on your paper. I wrote down two, this topic is related to my work and I need time to focus on my own self-care. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the situation that we're all experiencing now and why many of us are struggling a lot. Um, well beyond the infectious disease rate, uh, risk of COVID, there is a mental health risk as well. A series of surveys that were conducted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that more than 40% of Americans had at least one mental health condition linked to the pandemic. And that survey was actually done last June, so I'm expecting that number is probably higher now. Many people who overcome COVID experience serious mental health challenges soon after. One study found that one in five people who acquire the virus develop mental illness within the next 90 days. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what that number is and if that's been verified by other studies, but one, whatever the risk, we know that it's higher for people at this time. And then people of color have borne a disproportionate share of both the physical and mental health toll of this pandemic. They have experienced more sickness, 
more hospitalizations, more deaths, more suicides. And nearly half of Americans report that the coronavirus is harming their mental health. So we are experiencing and will continue to experience a third crisis following the virus and the economic fallout. We have a mental health crisis that will be with us probably for some time. With the pandemic, we've also experienced isolation. Isolation means having few relationships or infrequent social contact. Isolation is understandably exacerbated feelings of loneliness, which is a feeling of being alone about um, regardless of your social contact. And loneliness had been increasing in the United States before the pandemic, particularly actually for younger generations, um, maybe because more younger people live alone. Um, and those numbers have continued to increase during this past year. Some sources say that as many as 20% of adults report being lonely as a result of the social isolation of COVID. So that's concerning because of the clear links to depression and anxiety and suicide and many other health issues. An interesting thing that I learned recently in at least two places in the world, in Japan and the UK, we have ministers for loneliness. So they're appointed government positions that were created because of the significance of the experience of loneliness. So I'd love to see more attention paid to that topic in the United States in the future. So our next activity is to consider yourself on this very simple loneliness scale. On a scale from zero to 10, with zero being lowest and 10 being highest, write down loneliness and a number ranking your level of loneliness before the pandemic, how did you feel one year ago, and today, how do you feel now? And here are my responses. I ranked my loneliness before the pandemic at a four and my loneliness now at a seven. I think it's important to be able to name our experiences um, before we can really do the self-care that helps us uh, function better. So in these next few slides, I'm gonna be identifying what's happening now and why we are all seeking out resources to support our mental well-being. This uh, information about ambiguous loss is from Dr. Pauline Voss, who is a faculty member in family social science at the University of Minnesota. The definition of ambiguous loss is that it's a loss that remains unclear or full of uncertainty. We don't have all the facts, like not knowing when this pandemic will end or whether we will contact, contract COVID or how many of us will continue to be sick or die as we move into this stage of vaccination, how our economy will fare and recover, how our children in school will fare, and also the future is unknown. This pandemic is ongoing and it's without a clear ending even as we move into the stage of vaccination. People have questions like, when can I return to school and work? How safe will that be when I do it? When can I receive a vaccine? How long will the vaccine last? Uh, so the future is unknown and the situation can't be clarified or cured or fixed. We can do things to manage um, and we're gonna talk a lot about things we can do, but we can't make the pandemic go away. And finally, the losses can be physical or psychological or both and we have many types of losses this year. So we have financial losses, family and community loss, uh, loss of our typical rituals, freedom loss, loss of control over our daily schedules, loss of safety, a loss of trust. Uh, the world isn't the place that I thought it was. Um, it's not predictable anymore. And then physical losses, uh, even if we can't be with loved ones as they're sick or dying, we, we can't, um, even then we can't be with them. We can't mourn in the ways that we typically would uh, if we weren't experiencing a pandemic. So Dr. Boss says that naming the problem of ambiguous loss helps people understand that the stressor is not only the virus, but also the many ambiguous losses that go along with it. Grief is a feeling of sorrow, suffering, or distress, usually based on significant loss. Anticipatory grief happens when we don't know the outcome, kind of like ambiguous loss. So we are feeling a lot of types of grief uh, associated with all these losses. The takeaway is that understanding the types of grief and loss caused by COVID can help us move toward resilience. So I'm gonna ask you to list on your paper the most significant areas of loss that you've experienced during this pandemic. And I'm gonna give you a minute, it took me a minute to do this exercise. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of time for that. 
Okay, here's mine. I listed um, my losses as a uh, loss of social connections, a uh, loss of the feeling of security about being able to manage my own health, loss of time with my mother, and loss of my kids' loss of uh, developmental milestones, missing the important stages of their life this past year. In the interest of naming our experiences, I'd also like to talk a bit about trauma. Many people are experiencing this time as one of trauma. First of all, a person experiences trauma when they are subject to or witness injury or threat of injury. And the injury can be physical or psychological or both. And then traumatic events are defined not only by the nature of the event, but by the person's perception of it as overwhelming. This pandemic has certainly been overwhelming and traumatic for many. The threat of injury and sickness is widespread, even as we're moving beyond and our numbers are um, decreasing. As a population, we've been moving through a very difficult and uncertain experience. And during that time, there's also been a number of traumatic events that have occurred this year, including the murder of George Floyd and others that happened before and after his these events are also very traumatic and have heightened the sense of overwhelm, particularly for those in African-American communities. So we need to be attentive to the fact that many of us are experiencing um, what feels like trauma right now and overall have a decreased sense of safety. And safety is a critical part of mental well-being. All three of these, ambiguous loss and grief and trauma can affect our window of tolerance. This is an image from Leah's Pantry, which is a trauma-informed nutrition education program. First here, look at the middle of this slide, the picture in the middle. When you are within your window of tolerance, you can deal with what's happening to you. So life is still happening, bad things might still be happening, but you have the resources to respond to them. Maybe this is where many of us were before this past year, the window of tolerance here is shown in yellow on the left and right hand sides. So when pandemics happen or violence or isolation or trauma, as on the left hand side, our window shrinks. And that happens to many of us. What's, and it's easier then when with that limited window of tolerance to experience either hyper arousal where you can't calm down or hypo arousal where you're shutting down and you're struggling to stay engaged, you might be depressed at that time. So it's a small window of tolerance to handle what's going on around you. But we can expand our window of tolerance as on the right-hand side with help and support and self-care. So this is the reason why we're talking today about ways to practice self-care and to expand our ability to respond to what's outside of our control, what's happening out there that we can't um, change. I'd like to spend a little bit of time reviewing this model by Dr. Corey Keyes. Um, we used to think of mental health and mental illness as the same thing or as opposites, but I use this model in every presentation that I give because I think it uh, does a really nice job of identifying that mental illness and mental health are different from one another. In fact, they're on two different spectra. They're not opposites. So on the horizontal axis here, we have illness, either severe, mental illness on the left or no mental illness on the right. And then on the vertical axis, we have functioning, either poor mental health functioning on the bottom or optimal mental health functioning on the top. So this divides the population into several different quadrants. And we move around all through our lives depending on what our experiences are. So we have people who are in quadrant one, they have good mental health and no mental illness and we call that flourishing. There are people in quadrant two, they have severe stress on their mental health, but they don't have a mental illness. And we call that languishing. The people in quadrant three have severe stress on their mental health and they have a mental illness. So they are languishing with mental illness. And then the people in quadrant four have good mental health with a mental illness. So they're flourishing and they also have a mental health mental illness diagnosis. They probably have a lot of supports in place that help them function well and flourish in spite of that. So this is called the dual continuum model of mental health. And it reminds us that a person can experience a significant struggle without illness. Those are the people in quadrant two. 
or good mental health with illness. And those are the people in quadrant four. And I think sometimes we forget about those two uh, groups of our population. This model also introduces the idea of mental flourishing, which is the top half. So this discussion today is really about helping people move up toward flourishing, whether or not they have a diagnosis. So I'm going to ask you to participate in the next stage of our activity. Um, think for a moment about where in this picture you fall right now. And remember that this is temporary. You might think about where that, that dot has moved in the past year, but for today, for right now, where do you think that you are in this model? And you can just make a little dual continuum on your paper and just identify yourself with an, a dot. This is where I put myself. Um, I put myself a little bit in the languishing section, not way down in the bottom at all, but um, not, not quite flourishing at this point. So speaking of flourishing, if we're going to help people move up, we have to know when we're successful. So what is flourishing? There are several measures now. Um, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the scale that was created by Dr. Keyes. And the scales are quite similar to one another. Here are the components of Dr. Keyes' model. To flourish requires that we have both positive emotions and positive functioning. These are the things that pull us, pull us into a healthy and engaged life, our emotions and our functioning. So listen to these descriptions as I will ask you to identify one or two words on this slide or that I describe to you that are present in your life. So I'll go through them a little bit slowly. First, for flourishing, you need an emotional component, how we feel. So you generally have to feel happy, calm, mostly satisfied, interested in life. Second, you need a psychological component, which has to do with how we function as an individual. Uh, you need warm relationships. Uh, you need to like yourself, have a sense of identity and purpose, which means that you believe that your life has meaning, a sense of growth in your life, uh, being able to adapt your environment to meet your needs, and a sense of self-direction or autonomy. So those are the psychological components. And then finally, you need a social component, which has to do with how we function in society. Um, and people who have this believe that people accept and care about one another in the society that they live in. They believe that society is improving for people like, for people like you. Um, they believe that there is a sense of community or connectedness with the people they're around. They contribute to society and believe that their contribution is useful. And then finally, they find engagement with people meaningful, social coherence. So to um, this measure is actually based on the measure for depression. And so it's a similar um, set of requirements that people need in order to be determined mental flourishing. And we need one of the emotional components and six of either the psychological or the social components here. So when we look at this, clearly there's a lot more that we can do besides help people manage illness. We can do a lot to promote wellness. The next stage in our activity is to identify what from this list uh, is present in your life. Can you name a couple of mental flourishing components that are present for you? And I will share mine. I identified um, that I have warm and trusting relationships. Even as I'm isolated this year, there are people that I can call on. And then I belong to a community, uh, more than one actually, that accepts me and um, also that I can find virtually and call upon if I need them. Resilience is a concept that's related to mental flourishing. So I introduce it here because it gives us another lens to care for ourselves during this pandemic. Uh, the definition is the capacity to prepare for, adapt to and grow through trauma or disruption or loss. This definition acknowledges that stress and adversity is a precursor to resilience. 
and also that resilience isn't just bouncing back or as some people like to um, call it bouncing forward after facing an adversity, but also the ability to be prepared for adversity and to grow as a result of it. So it's important to remember that the most common response to trauma and adversity is resilience. Often when we think of trauma and adversity, we think of struggle, we think of loss, we think of damage. The most common response to trauma and adversity is resilience. So eventually with work, we, we tend to develop into resilient beings uh, by facing adversity in our lives. I like this quote that I um, included here and the handbook that it came from, which is called the COVID-19 Mental Health Handbook. Experiencing joy requires work and practice. It is a habit formed by seeking out the things, people and activities that give you profound joy. So developing resilience requires work and it fluctuates over time. The more we seek out and practice the things that bring us joy, the more likely we are to flourish in the midst of the experiences of this pandemic. But functioning isn't all dependent on the individual either. Uh, so far, I've been talking about individual methods of self-care, individual experiences of this pandemic. This image comes also from Leah's pantry and it reflects how to create trauma-informed systems or environments. And I think it's relevant to us because of the importance of using this trauma-informed lens as we manage this pandemic and learn to heal. And it reflects how self-care happens within a context of other needs in warm and trusting relationships and in healing communities. So a little bit about each of these levels. First, um, creating your authentic self is not about perfection and it's not about engaging in therapy necessarily, although it can be. It's not about um, doing self-care that is expensive and timely, but it is about promoting those three areas of mental flourishing, emotional, psychological, and social functioning. So you can begin by reflecting on where you are and what you need. That varies from person to person, depending on their situation and their interests and their desires. What's important is to value self-care, to set an intention and set aside time to practice it. And Chelsea will share some specifics that we hope will help you re-energize during this time. The second level, compassionate relationships are also a form of self-care. Remember that social functioning is part of mental flourishing, and that's critical during this time of isolation. As I mentioned earlier, higher levels of depression and anxiety are happening now during the pandemic, partly because of isolation and loneliness. Um, so engaging with others helps us thrive and heal. So that's one important source of self-care. And then these first two steps help us create healing communities that all of us need. Healing is something that individuals can work toward, but whole communities can also experience healing, just as whole communities can experience stress and trauma. Uh, so Chelsea will talk a little bit more about that too. My last slide has a bigger picture of mental well-being within a societal context. This is an ecological model, which shows the levels of influence within a person's life. It reflects research that shows connections between your mental health and all kinds of things in each circle here, relationships, organizations, communities, policy, and society. So if you were to place yourself in the inner circle here, your mental health is determined by individual factors like biology and life experience and your own stress response. We tend to focus on those, over-focus on those actually a lot when we're thinking about mental well-being. But your mental health functioning is also influenced by your relationships, like your home environment, or what kind of social support you have, by the organizations that you participate in, your schools, your employers, their environments, are they supportive environments? Are they stigmatizing to you? Uh, the communities that you live in, housing and neighborhoods, is your housing overcrowded? Is the neighborhood welcoming to you, for example? The policies that uh, in your community are policies in place that support your mental well being? How about mental illness treatment? Do they allow you to manage your mental health needs? And then society, social conflict, migration, war, racism, poverty, the very large um, experiences of our society that also affect individuals' mental well being. 
this model is a work in progress that several of us at the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Department of Health have been creating to visually show the many areas of influence on individual mental health. And this points out not only the breadth of research about mental well being, and there's much more than is shown here, but also that there's many, many points of intervention, no matter our role or our setting. So while today is about self care, keep in mind that we each sit within this larger context that influences how we're doing all the time. I am going to stop sharing my slides and turn this over to Chelsea. Thank you, Carrie. And I do see, um, Carrie, just our discussion around mental well-being and thinking about the number of different concepts that there's no factors that are important in our lives to be mentally well. I personally was journaling alongside and definitely have some good notes to think about as we continue this conversation. So we're transitioning a bit to thinking now about revisiting some strategies that we already have, thinking about some new strategies that we can consider to take care of ourselves and others. And I'm sure that many of us have some understanding of self and collective care, definitely heard this term maybe more frequently recently. And again, I think it's important, as Carrie said, to acknowledge that we have collectively been living through a number of different challenges that have been new to us, um, a pandemic for nearly a full year, some of us experiencing or continue to experience racism or community unrest, experiencing high levels of exhaustion, toxic stress, sadness, and other emotions. So it's completely understandable if we do not have that same level of energy or motivation to thoughtfully care for ourselves as we have once before. So we are going to look a little bit more closely at some strategies to think about some small changes that we can do in our day to day um, and give you an opportunity to think about what may work best for you. And as we transition, Carrie and I always love to incorporate some um, self-care strategies. And what I'm realizing now is I don't think I shared my sound. So I'm going to have to reshare for us here one second so that we can thoroughly engage in this practice. But what we find definitely beneficial with grounding practices is that it allows us to be present in the moments that we're in to refocus and really to pause and set intention. So some of you may have seen this um, brief one minute video from calm.com. I love the nature and the sound and it's going to guide us in a small or short breathing exercise. It'll allow us to breathe in, hold, and then breathe out. So I will play it now, give you an opportunity to follow alongside as we continue in our presentation. So here we go. Thank you for joining me in this process and visualization. It's really nice to be somewhere at least a, that looks a little bit warmer than we the weather we have currently in Minnesota. So we will move forward to think about healing through culture, which is an important conversation to have as we consider the conversation around self and collective care. And some of us may be familiar with this concept, but really there's a, an extensive relationship that culture has on our ability to be well, to heal, to feel resilient. And we could spend a lot of time here, but we thought it was important just to introduce this concept to all of you today. So when we think about culture, we can think about practices, we can think about food and language and customs and medicines. 
And it's also important to note that when we're talking about culture here, we're not only thinking about culture being defined as racial or our ethnic identity, but that also our culture could be where we feel the most comfortable, where we feel safe. And the, the fact that we can really belong and identify with a number of different cultures. So we can think about, again, our values, our spiritual beliefs, the things that we enjoy to do on a on a day to day basis. And I'll share an example from my partner who used to be a professional skateboarder and really identifies very intimately with the community and the culture around skateboarding. So just a few things to consider. And I'll also share a little bit deeper about um, our racial and ethnic cultures as well. So participation in traditional practices can of course be a part of our long journey in healing and recovery and taking care of ourselves. And especially for those who of us who may be far removed from our racial and ethnic backgrounds and identities through migration, both willing or forced, and some of us who have had these practices stripped from our communities. It's really a way of reconnecting to cultural practices to allow us to thrive and be mentally well. So as I shared here, culture helps us define the activities that we want to engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. So how we look at um, or consider taking care of our physical, mental, emotional, social, spiritual well-being, um, our cultures really help pave the way on the activities that we choose to engage in every single day. We also know that our traditions can help define and create the communities that we are in, which as Carrie has talked about before, the importance of our social and emotional connection and developing relationships plays a major factor in our ability to be holistically well. And we also know that culture and community helps us make connections to ourselves, to others, to the world, to find purpose and meaning in life, and to also feel a strong sense of belonging. So just sharing a little bit here, we know that there are many benefits to engaging in our communities, exploring our culture. And I want to acknowledge as well that we can explore healing strategies from cultures that we do not identify with. And of course, there are many um, best practices of how to do so, especially engaging in activities that we find meaning in, connection to, and purpose in those practices, and supporting um, healers from the communities where these practices originate in. So as part of our journaling experience, I'm going to invite you now to think of a personal example of how you currently engage in cultural healing practices in your daily life or even how you see yourself engaging in these practices to aid in your journey of mental well-being. And as you think about your personal example, I can share one of mine. Um, I have multiple cult or two cultures that I have um, been connected to throughout my life in, in a number of different ways and currently wanting to be um, have a deeper connection with, with my family and my culture and tradition. So I am learning one of the languages of my cultures um, and also studying some traditional medicines that have been part of my, my family's history for many generations. And that's just one example I'm sharing with you. And I'll, I'll give us a few more seconds to think about your example as you write it down on your sheet of paper. We are going to think a little bit more about some self-care strategies, these three areas that are known as the three R's, relate, or regulate, relate, and reason that were developed by Dr. Bruce Perry originally to help children regulate emotions and to process sensory information. So it's this idea that we individually select strategies that would allow children and resonate with children to be able to first regulate their emotions, then develop nurturing relationships to individuals in their lives, which gives space then for a child to have a mind that's ready to problem solve and to make decisions. And we know while this did focus around um, the younger people in our community that this understanding, this process and learning to self-regulate is important to all of us in, in all aspects of our life. So this process really gives us a, a visual 
and how to think through the strategies that we can engage in on a day-to-day -day basis to be mentally well. So I'm going to share this visual with you to kind of help us get a deeper understanding of how this process can work. So we know first that our, our body is giving us input and telling us how we're doing, maybe how we're feeling, if we're stressed, if we're dysregulated. And then we also have this input coming to us from the outside world. So this is all being processed in our body and giving us an ability to regulate, feel regulated or dysregulated. So really this, this concept is that we first want to focus on regulation. It's our survival mode. It's our body telling us whether we want to fight, flight, freeze, flee, or be calm. And we want to engage in practices that are allow our body to be calm, both physically and emotionally. Once we've kind of reached the stage of regulation, we can move to this next process of being able to relate to ourselves and others in the world and really build healthy connections. And then giving way to our ability to thoughtfully reason with the world, reflect on the world, and really creating opportunities to engage in meaningful dialogue with others, solve, our, solve problems, discover new things, and process our sensory inputs that we visited in the beginning of this, um, this visual and our emotions. And it's important, I think, to say just briefly that to be most successful in taking care of ourselves and taking other care of others that we want to practice some of these strategies every day so that they become part of our regular routines, just like brushing our teeth or washing our hands are part of our daily routines. So let's dive a little bit into examples around these three um, concepts. The first being regulate. So we know that um, this could be a number of different activities, of course, and I will just share them here. They allow us to pause in our days, to set attention, intention, to refocus, and to really be in the present moment, which in turn allows us to get into our bodies, to feel safe and prepared for the things, many things that we need to do in our days. So activities could look like the breathing practice that we just engaged in together, getting outside, getting into our bodies, standing up to stretch every hour, again, feeling more connected to our physical body, a sensory awareness practice like five, four, three, two, one, that really allows us to take in our immediate environment, and then also listening to music. So I want to pause here and give you an opportunity to think of a personal example of regulation to write onto your piece of paper that maybe you know works for you or a new regulation activity that you'd like to try. So I'll give us a few moments to pause here as you write that down. Okay, we will move next to relate. So we know the importance of nurturing our relationships, developing social and emotional connection, needing to feel a sense of belonging and a sense of community. So of course, there are many different strategies that we can do to obtain these feelings of security. One being planning intentional, thoughtful time with our loved ones. And of course, this will look different for all of us um, as we continue to experience this pandemic. It could be spending time with those in our immediate homes or um, virtual time or distance time with those who live a little bit further away from us. Also scheduling a check-in with a colleague, someone that we work very closely with um, and, and really truly asking, how are you? And, and giving opportunities for that individual to share and for you to share as well. We talked a little bit briefly about reconnecting to our traditions, being able to have a deeper understanding of maybe our cultural practices or our community as a way to relate to our world. Sending letters to friends, I know has, is an example that I've heard a lot of people engaging in as we, we want to continue to support our relationships. And also signing up for educational emails, which is something that I've been doing to just keep grounded and connected into experiences that individuals are going through in our world. And again, I'm going to pause here for you to write an example of how you'd like to engage in relationship and connection um, or the things that you're already doing to do, to do so. 
And then our last area here is reason. So again, when we are at this stage, we're able to reflect and discover and inquire and, and practice skills, put these skills into action and make some change. So these activities, of course, are just a few examples that we can think about, but journaling our emotions, our thoughts, the things that we want to keep with us positive and negative throughout the day, preparing a meal, one getting in touch with your environment, the food that you're preparing, cooking, consuming for yourself and for those that you love, learning a new skill, reading, and really this time allows us to name our emotions, to understand what we're feeling and why, and then kind of what can we do with that information. I'm going to pause again here for you to think of a personal example of how you'd engage in an activity that allows us to reflect and discover and inquire. And I think it's important to say as you're thinking and finishing up um, writing some of these things down, these strategies down, that there are over, there is overlap here. So a lot of these processes are related, strategies can be related, and it's something that we want to go throughout the day. So we want to think about this regulation, this feedback um, as a process that we engage in every single day. And I know I shared many different activities and strategies that we can con consider and engage in, and that in itself can be overwhelming. And I wanna just emphasize here really the importance of focusing on regulation, focusing on pausing, listening to what our body tells us it needs. It may need water, it may need to stretch, it may need to talk to somebody. Um, that, that first step of really regulating our body, listening to what it's telling us is a really good place to start to help us to figure out where to go next. And that we want to praise ourselves for small things that we accomplish, especially in these times of high stress, because what may normally have worked for us in the past may not be working for us now, and that we want to find a, a way to keep exploring what resonates with us and what may help. We're going to pause one more time for you to think about one action that you could take within the next week to find renewed energy um, to continue to take care of yourself and others. So I invite you now to think about this action and to write it on your piece of paper. So as we are finishing our time together today, I wanted to share this resource that Carrie put together, gives you some additional strategies that you can take to take care of yourself as we continue to experience isolation. Here are some other ways that you can connect with us through Facebook, Instagram, and other social media platforms. And um, Carrie and my email addresses if you have any other questions after our presentation today. And thank you all. Um, I really enjoyed this visual that Carrie has shared with me that self-care is not selfish. It is definitely important. And we want to think about how we can engage in taking care of ourselves every single day.